and a very warm welcome to this edition of the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV brought to you by the Center for Constitutional Governance. I am Isaac Kwagala, your host. Today, we reflect on the general state of the Ugandan economy with a special focus on the taxman, the Uganda Revenue Authority, and the recently released report on the national budget framework for the year 2024-2025. Joining me to discuss the substance of today's topic is Professor Mwangusa Devesa. Thank you. Professor Devesa is a distinguished academic and a political analyst. I am also joined by Ms. Priscilla Amongin. Priscilla Amongin is a youth leader in Uganda. Professor, Good morning and say hello to the viewership. Uh, good morning uh, to you, uh, your view, viewers and listeners, and good morning to you, the moderator, and good morning to you, my panelist. Thank you, Professor Priscilla. Thank say you so hello much. to the audience. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're very glad to be here. Good morning, uh, Isaac and Professor. My name is Priska. Amongin Mengero, and I'm glad to be in this space. Professor, let us start by evaluating the performance of the taxman, the Uganda Revenue Authority. Now, we understand from their performance report for the year ending 2023-2024, that's last year, there was a steady and notable rise in the revenue collection. Uh, for the first time, they hit a mark of 25 trillion Ugandan shilling. But we ask the question as a, a citizen and an observer uh, of the fiscal discipline and the expenditure processes of government, what's your impression of that figure vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what's being done on the ground? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the performance of URA in general terms it should not be determined by how much it has collected because that one would have to be translated into the performance of the economy because you correct according to the economy. So you may find you have done better in terms of the money, which you could have done better because there have been more imp imports or there have been more activities within the country. So you have to look at performance vis-a-vis -vis GDP ratio, I think. What is the revenue corrected vis-a-vis -vis the ratio to GDP? If the GDP has risen, as I have heard, that the GDP has grown or the economy is growing, for the, I don't know, six, five billion, you have to look at the revenue authority vis-a-vis -vis the GDP ratio. For a long time, Uganda Revenue Authority has been the worst performer within the East African region. Forget about Burundi and the and, 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 South no, 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 Sudan. And South Sudan. Mm. Uh, Kenya has been collecting more, so is Tanzania and Rwanda. Collecting more in, in ratio to GDP. I'm not talking about the amount the corrected. Amount. Because the amount corrected would be, depend on the size of the economy. And therefore, Kenya, of course, has the it's biggest larger. economy in the region, mm. followed by Tanzania, I think followed by Uganda. And Rwanda, they are almost at the same level. Uh, but of course, Uganda has a larger economy. But in terms of GDP ratio, Revenue Authority has been performing the worst. And the president has also been complaining, actually. Says you have stagnated at between 12 and 13 percent. Why don't you go be, be beyond that? Some people might now blame Uganda Revenue Authority as such. No, the issue is on Uganda Re Revenue Authority as in terms of, as in respect of correcting, but also you look at the general fiscal policy of government. Now, the, the policy is set by the Minister of Finance. So you find some of the challenges of Uganda Revenue Authority in collecting the tax. Of course, there is a narrow tax base that has been there and there has been complaint. 
because maybe among other reasons, because the Uganda's economy is still informal, mm -hmm. largely informal, and therefore <coughs> not easy to tax. But again, there are a lot of tax exemptions. You find there are arbitrary tax exemptions by the corporates, by the investors. Uh, arbitrary meaning that there is no good criteria who should be taxed and who is exempted and, and things like that. Uh, there is also, I think, what they call um, double taxation agreements. Double taxation agreement is somehow a complex issue, but you find some corporate, some foreign companies uh, not taxed because there was an agreement with the company, with the, uh, a country, and uh, there is offshore. The funds are taken outside the and they are not taxed. Mm. And there is tax avoidance there and, and, and tax uh, uh, problems. So ultimately, and then there are certain sectors that are not taxed, like uh, um, agriculture is, is not taxed. Mm. Uh, it is exempted. But I don't think that should be correct. Yes. The Isn't that a good incentive no. to promote? No, 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 no. Uh, Agriculture, uh, since it's well, the backbone of the economy. Other countries which tax agriculture are developing. <laughs> what are you saying? You see, we are not saying that they should tax peasants, an ordinary peasant person. You put a threshold. Why should somebody with 100 cows, exotic cows, by the way, not be taxed, and you tax some civil servant who earns 400,000 shillings? Is that fair? Why should somebody who sells a lorry of matoke Every week, every two weeks or a month, not be taxed. And you tax some civil servant or an employee of a certain company earning 350000 per month. Tax should also be fair. Should be seen to be fair and justice. We These days we talk about tax justice. Mm. At the end of the day, you find the tax falls on a few, a few individuals in this country. And the others are outside the tax bracket. Of course, we have got indirect tax paid here and there. But again, that consumption tax is, is, is not progressive. It is retrogressive. We should be having a regime of progressive tax. Taxing income, not consumption. When you tax consumption, you are taxing everybody. You are not taxing the rich. You are taxing the poor. Actually, the tax falls more on the poor rather than the rich. So the rich get off because they are not within the tax bracket. And there are very many people downtown in Chikubo there mm. who are, are, are very rich. You find somebody having five trucks, has, having a lot of land, having a lot of wealth. But if you were to calculate how much revenue is got from that person, mm. you find it is very little. You find somebody having a 20 billion building in town. But you look at how much returns from the tax. Very little. You find somebody having a car of 600 million. But to look at the returns to, to revenue authority, is very little. So the, the revenue authority, uh, but also not the revenue authority as such, let's not put it on revenue authority. We put it on finance and the government generally has to review and reform uh, the tax system mm. such that one, there is justice, and two, there is correction of at least 15 to 17 percent ratio to GDP. Mm. But otherwise, the tax regime and tax system is unfair. I am told gold is hardly taxed, and the biggest export earner for Uganda as we talk is gold, I'm mm. told, in the region of about 1.3 trillion. Mm. Uh, no, not trillion, a billion, I think. Dollars. No, no. Oh, okay, in dollars. Yes. Yes. Billion in mm. dollars. Mm. It is. Uh, it has... Uh, 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 Surpassed but, uh, coffee. It, uh, long ago, mm. coffee does not bring in even 1 billion. But gold tourism. brings in 1.3 billion mm. dollars. But if you go to the tax uh, women and the men, these ones, you find they have nearly paid nothing. And that is where we get it wrong. Otherwise, we should have tax justice, but also a higher ratio 
of tax to GDP so that we fund public expenditure and public investment. Thank you, Professor, for your views. Uh, Priscilla, Professor here promotes Prisca. Professor here promotes the concept of tax justice, but I want to understand mm. there is some criticism today directed at the Uganda Revenue Authority for deepening uh, the tax base instead of expanding it, like Professor here is alluding to, so that we have people fairly pay their share of the taxes. Sure, sure. Why should it focus on a narrow uh, section mm. of the population mm. instead of you know, creating uh, a, a framework mm. that targets the larger section of the broad population? Sure. But from your uh, UNE youth point of view, what's your assessment of URA's performance? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, what Professor was speaking about, those were very critical issues, and I'd like to speak into some of those issues. URA has performed very well because for the last five years, URA had not hit their target. Now, in the last financial year, URA hit their target. Upon hitting the target, of course, the target has to get stretched even more. So this currently this financial year 2024, URA is collecting 30 trillion. Now, when you look at our country's uh, budget, the budget that was passed for this, for this financial year, it's about 52.7. So if you are is collecting 30, already we are still uh, we're already underperforming mm -hmm. from the word go. Mm -hmm. Because out of 52, meaning we're still Have borrowing. Have a deficit of 22. Exactly. We're still <laughs> borrowing. That's about 50, 57% of the budget that you are is actually collecting locally. Now, once you begin from that level already, that's already, there's already a disarray. Because now what URA is collecting is not sufficient to finance the expenditures of government and everything government is going to use this money for. Uh, URA as, as an organization, of course, has made some strides. There have been very many strides that have been made in respect to ensuring that this tax base is actually widened. For now, uh, the same taxpayers are still the same that are being taxed. But of course, there's a program called Tax Register Expansion Program that URA is trying to do to ensure that everyone who's in formal, in formal business is able to come on board. Because without us getting the person in Chukubo on the register, or people doing businesses online and everything, we'll continue taxing the, the, the people whom we know are on the payrolls, the you, the him, whom we know are on payroll and have pay. Okay, pay is going to keep on coming, but there, there's VAT that is being, that is still a struggle. VAT is a very interesting tax because that is tax that is recognized upon value being added upon a product. I was talking about agricultural products. Uh, most agricultural products are exempt. And by the way, everything you already does is, is backed by that act. That is passed by our mother body, parliament. So it's unless parliament looks at, into these laws again and redefines them that you are going to execute. Because you are going to execute outside of, can't operate outside of that act. So the act says agricultural supplies are exempt. So unprocessed milk, all this is exempt. The Matoke was talking about. But then the tax comes in now when value is added, okay? Now this milk maybe is being turned from this product, maybe to yogurt, processed yogurt and all mm, that. That is, what, milk. that is now where the tax comes in. But ideally, mm -hmm. as, you, as you said, uh, given our country's agriculture really predominantly, that is why those products are like that. Um, so definitely in terms of, and the, the CG keeps on talking about this, it keeps on saying we are still doing badly. Even if you hit your target as, 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 as a tax man, you're still doing badly. In terms of the economy, we are still doing bad because our tax to GDP ratio is still very, very low. It's at 13 to 14. Now, for a country to be developed and to be independent, there must be about 18 to 20. If you look at Africa and compare other African countries, let's say South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, they're at about 25, 20 to 25, 26. Now, it's unless Ugandans agree and understand that, you know what, it's us who are going to fix our country because you're seeing now that donors are pulling out, all this is happening, you've been reading the news. So what does that leave us with? We all have to collect money from within Uganda itself. So it's unless Ugandans have that mindset change and everyone says, you know what, let me pay my fair share of tax. And after the tax has been collected, it is now those appropriating to ensure this money goes to the right spaces and this money does exactly what people want to see. Because someone is going to tell you, you're collecting money from me, but my road has portals, okay? Money, picking money from me, but there's no medicine in the hospital. So that balance has to really be, it all goes back to government. Government has a very rich role to play to ensure that this money is actually value for money. It is still little, but in the little that we have, are we using it properly or are we using it wastefully? That is also a question which we should ask ourselves. But As, Pliska, is it fair to ascribe 
uh, substantially all these failures on the ordinary citizen and you absorb government of responsibility. Of course government has a because responsibility. Because ultimately, mm -hmm. it should be the responsibility of government to facilitate a well-performing, mm -hmm. functional, robust mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. And in turn, the responsibility or obligation of the citizen should be to comply, to comply with the tax the regime place. in place mm -hmm. and pay the tax. Yes. So the question I want to ask specifically is in respect of the young people. Mm -hmm. Because today, uh, our government you know, ostensibly promotes participation of the youth in the yes, money economy, yes, what exactly. not. Mm -hmm. But how are these people in a compressed and contracted economy like we have? How can they be able to pay these taxes? I think the environment is viable. You realize uh, you can't, the, in the first year of business, you don't have to pay any tax in the first year, within, your first, within the first year of business. That's for the youth specifically? Every business. Most Every business. Businesses. So, mm. so tax is recognized upon you making profits. Mm. Tax is charged, let's say income tax is charged, is 30% of the profit you have made. If in your books of accounts, your records are very clear, no one is going to squeeze you for tax. And that is one thing you must get into, must get right. That no one is going to squeeze you for tax. If you want to make profit, if you're going to share your books of accounts, this is, these are my expenses, my purchases are here. I have to make profit. No one is going to tax you. You will have a teen, yes, you're registered, but no one can tax you. If you have not made profit, tax is charged only on income made from a business. So it's not charged on gross. Like it's not charged just, oh, I began a business, I had my five million capital, I come and charge you. No. So but I today think you are referring to income tax. That is income tax, tax, yes. But, also, but you are not referring to uh -huh. all taxes. Of course, if I have an employee, definitely, <laughs> and they're above the threshold of 235, definitely the employee has to pay based on that threshold because the act is very clear. If it's 10%, if it's, they charge, the thresholds are very clear. You earn 10M, you're not charged the same tax as someone who has 400. But there is customs tax. Of course. The business people pay customs tax. There is definitely tax in every yeah. angle. If you're going to import products, you're going to have to pay the taxes. So that, but that is an expense. So you may not have to pay income tax, but the cost can't be the same, definitely. If, you're, if I'm going to pay withholding tax, it can't be the same as the 30% I would have paid if I was getting a profit from my business. So I think, okay, taxes in all angles, definitely. I mean, if you bring in a product from outside of the country, that has to be taxed. If you have employees, Definitely, you have to withhold on their on their payment. If you have value added to a product and you're manufacturing, definitely you have to pay VAT. But I think the environment is favorable, and I think someone can start. In terms of starting, for the young people, anyone can start a business on a small scale. Personally, I began a business of recent. I got a little money. I began selling uh, ice cream. That's a small business. And till I'm able to break even, of course, when I was buying the machine, I had to pay the VAT. But as I'm, st but if, but if I cannot pay any income tax till I make the profits of that business. So I think the environment is viable, and I think what government is doing to encourage young people to join the business economy is very good. Because once I'm selling something, I'll definitely get someone to buy what I'm selling. Let's all participate in selling something. Yeah, mm. Professor, let us now address the question of uh, some of the enforcement mechanisms that the Uganda Revenue Authority is employing to uh, collect the taxes. Recently, there is uh, widespread uh, anger from the public that the Uganda Revenue Authority has also you know, taken a violent turn in as far as collection of taxes is concerned. There are uh, widespread reports, especially in the northern part of the country, that you know they chase people, bundle people up, even in some unfortunate circumstances, uh, some lives have been lost. Is this a viable way of, of, of collecting taxes? Can this be sustainable if you do not have collaboration uh, between the polity, the population, and the taxman? How does this work out? Uh, let's first say that all over the world, the history and today, mm. No one wants to be taxed. Mm. And uh, the tax law is the most hated law. Mm. Somehow, there has to be enforcement of one kind or another for people to, to pay. If you just leave people to continue being paying voluntarily, mm. people may not pay. So the, But again, the tax must be fair. Mm. You know, at times... You feel bad that you are compelled to pay when you see your neighbor is not paying. Mm -hmm. There are some people who import in this country 
And the business people know them. I wish we had somebody from, I don't know where you didn't invite, let's like, say somebody from Casita. Uh, mm. There are some people in this country, big shots, uh, who import certain things, either dodging tax one kind or another, and people know them. So when you are in a business, I'm told, when you are in a business with such a people, with such a person, what you do, you get out of that business. Because he will undersell you. He, there is a way he doesn't pay the taxes as he's supposed to do. And therefore, when he brings goods, he sells them cheaply Below the market price. Compared, compared to you. To you. Mm. And you end up losing out. So what you do, you shift from that. So one of the business acumen of the Kampala people around is to look out for somebody whom they know is connected, well connected, you look at what he or she is employee, importing. You shift away from that immediately. When people know that, why doesn't the new authority, if it was fair, go to Casita, go to those people, even do some intelligence, find out who is. Unfortunately, that person might be so well connected that if you are the one who is reporting, you might lose your job. And nobody would want to lose a job with URA. So they just keep quiet. That's why you see people progressing. I was one time talking to the deputy Japanese ambassador. And he was wondering how the economy and management of fiscal policy is done in Uganda. That you can see a building, a 10-story building in Kampala. Huge. He says in his country, belong to an individual. He says in Japan, you hardly find an individual constructing such a building. Either it is government or it is a company, a corporate, not an individual. Mm. How does an individual do that business, avoid taxes, and construct that building, that huge building, which possibly cost 20 billion shillings? So that means there are tax loopholes here and there. Others might be unknown. That is understood. There are those who know how to evade tax. But in other respects, they are known. And it's not even exempted. They are not even exempted. Mm -hmm. Because most exemption, I think, is on investments, not on these imports, most of it. But they are known only that they are untouchable. And we have to look at this from the political economy angle. Why do other people, why is the burden of tax going to some people and others are not affected. Mm. Why, why doesn't the Revenue Authority deliberately go to look at, now there is the TIN numbers, there is the uh, ID number. You see, you can easily follow uh, people. Why are they, why is the government following up people diligently on the issues of money laundering? And in most cases, for those who probably do not support the government, and not diligently going to see why some people have got a lot of wealth, but tax returns cannot be seen. I think mm. that one can be a follow-up. It can be a follow-up. So anyway, to go back to your question, uh, tax generally is something that people don't like to pay. And more so again when it falls on a few people, then feel, people feel it more than if there was a broad base mm. and there was a tax justice, you have mentioned the North. I don't know. I didn't know that one. Yes, I didn't know. I am surprised about that one. Much more so if you consider the Mid North, cool. especially Achori region, uh, uh, apparently in terms of uh, 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 UBOS, the Grand Bureau of Statistics. That is the poorest region. I was surprised to find that. Actually, is poorer than even Karamoja and some areas in eastern Uganda. So when you tell me that the tax burden is again falling on the poorest, that is now interesting. It's, 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 interesting it's, it's the burden to, of human find, rights uh, violations find in respect of the revenue collection strategy enforced by the URA. Enforced by URA yes. and the, the enforcement measures. The force. Uh, yes, force. Uh, to collect I have the heard taxes. the Commissioner General and the others from Revenue Authority saying that it is their tax friendly, you are is tax friendly. Uh, and so when they report that one, maybe something can be done. 
But at the same time, as I said earlier on, a tax is not something so voluntary. Mm. Somehow the government has to use uh, some enforcement mechanisms provided, provided, yeah, I repeat, mm. there is tax justice. That there are others who are exempted on reason, for reasons we don't know. There are those who are officially exempted. But there are also those who are, uh, who are unofficially uh, but privileged. Uh. to cut out their businesses and they are not as tax heavy as others. You know, sometimes tax can be political. It used to be very prominent in Moji's Kenya uh, that if you are in opposition, they will tax you heavily <laughs> in order to punish you politically. Oh, Impoverish you. <laughs> so that you, you stop shouting. Mm. And when you stop shouting, then they will reduce you on your tax. <laughs> now, when you will start taxing people Politically, then you will have That's tax injustice, injustice. Mm. but secondly, you will, have, you will not meet your targets. She has talked of the targets, but I think we are disagreeing here. Me, uh, the, the, target, yes. the, the target the government can set even a yes. smaller target. Mm -hmm. The target should be can UIA Gross. Gross. have Gross. a tax correction of at least 17% of the ratio? Definitely. Of GDP Definitely. because it has That's stagnated at 12, 13, 14 now, and therefore that journey has stagnated. I mean, how do you start working even when you are 30 years, you are, you are, you are still crowding? Because you are a, as an institution, I think is more than 30 years old now. But, Professor, is that target realistic in a contracted and compressed economy, economy like Uganda? Because we work with what, they, what, is, what the Ugandans can give. I don't know what we are talking about. It seems we are not talking about the same wavelengths. No. I'm not talking about the amount. Certainly. I'm talking the, about the, the GDP the, ratio. Yes, the GDP ratio. So what, 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 what is the problem there? I Why can't the Uganda correct it? I, I am saying, given the practical economic realities on the ground. No, no, no. no. That has nothing to do with economic realities. Even the poorest country can correct 17% of GDP. You talk about maybe the economy, the practical reality of informal sector, but then you can find a way of taxing the informal sector using maybe some flat rate. The point you are making seems mm. to be about the amount. Not the amount. But I the GDP ratio has nothing to do with the economy. So how are you going to target the informal sector if the reasoning is, for example, they are not able to raise uh, a certain threshold of the, the, the tax that, no, no, that you no, want no. to tax. The informal sector has got very much money. Downtown Kampala, people have got money, but they don't capture them. It is, a, it, is, it is the sophistication of the Uganda Revenue Authority as a tax management, management institution body. Mm. body to find out those people who are not taxed and tax them. It is a, a science of tax management, that one. It is not a question. And some people who are in informal sector are there deliberately. Some may be there deliberately. To they, evade? To evade. Mm. And yet, that's the duty of Uganda Revenue Authority. But also, Minister of Finance, let's not look at the Revenue Authority, the corrector now, mm. but also the policy maker. The policy maker can make a policy in such a way that you have new tax policies and uh, that's fiscal policy issues now. Mm -hmm. Can the fiscal policy make sure that they become sophisticated? We have economists, we have uh, uh, statisticians, we have all manner of government of officials. Can't they find out how to raise the tax from the GDP ratio of 14% to 17%? This has nothing to do with, the, has little to do with the economy general performance. I saw you taking us to economy performance. No. Even <laughs> if the economy is doing very poorly, the question is mm. there is a GDP. Now, is the economy... Which is an indicator of the economy's performance, ultimately. No. Uh -uh. I think we have failed to understand each other. By the way, Uganda's economy now is doing better. Mm, that's true. Statistically. Did you know that? Yes. 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 Statistically. If you look at the exports, mm. export earnings, mm. they are going very high. But we have just told you that gold is not taxed. Now, is that a question of economic performance? Oh, that's a tax policy question. It's a that's policy, a policy question. question. Yes. That's a political policy question mm. and tax policy, fiscal policy, tax question. It's not a question of government 
the, the, the economy of Uganda, we are told now, is doing better than the rest of East Africa mm. in, in the current year mm. in terms of economic growth. Mm. So why aren't we growing again in terms of tax correction, commensurate with tax growth? That's, oh, the, yo, that's so a question I, I, of, I understand you, Professor. That's a question of efficiency, yo, yo. effectiveness, and justice. So... You, it's about the consideration is about proportionality. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yes. I, I, I get. Not, not economic performance. Not, not performance. No, no, no. no. Just Thank to, you, Professor. Just to speak into mm. what Professor was saying about the big shots and some people were. I mean, if you're in your research master, you're going to have all the information. You may know something which I don't know. You was in Chikoma, you know something which I don't know. So this goes back to information sharing. So why sharing. don't you go there? By the way, right now you're raising the pieces of traders. Even we've been having meetings with Casita, there's been so much sensitization happening. If you've been seeing the engagements with Chairman Casita and URA and the whole team, what's happening is that URA is trying and to is a, cracking down a, by using it. told you those big shots who evade tax. I have not heard what happened in those oh. discussions, but, but definitely <laughs> someone, has to, they someone, has, to blow, someone they has to blow the whistle. <laughs> someone has to blow the whistle and say. <laughs> <laughs> someone has to blow the whistle and say so and so you doing this. And then our, we have a team, we have, we have intelligence, we have uh, tax investigations, we have all those people. That is their work. So just uh, in respect to the issue of um, the, 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 the informal man, how are we getting to him? That is why we brought uh, services like IFRIS ensuring that everyone has a fiscalized receipt for us to be able to get input output to, to get the movement of that to track that VAT movement if this is already then it's actually a project under undertaken right now all over Kampala it's happening well our teams are out and they're looking forward and they're looking at seeing who's evading taxes there's digital tax stamps there are very many projects which have been done by the tax man definitely but of course as you say more has to be done to ensure that money that last coin from the downtown person is actually brought into the economy. Because if that money doesn't come into the economy, we'll continue deepening the gap and not widening the base. So definitely a lot of work is still being done. And of course, people also are very elusive, as you as you can, as you as you know. A businessman is elusive. People, someone can be in a business, change a team, change location. It's not easy given the way our country is. Another way how we lose out tax in relation to GDP. Mm. Corruption. I mean, most, most people earn through corruption. Mm. Now, if I'm earning through corruption, how will you know how much I'm earning and how will you tax me? Mm. Unless you have got some indirect ways yes, of, getting that of getting that tax, actually getting even that money somehow, somewhere. Mm. Because, like, say, let's talk about procurement or in the roads. You know, I'm told there is a lot of corruption in the road, the road. construction mm. uh, uh, and compensation. Mm. And this one, by the way, there are these offices, let me mention it here which we should focus on as citizens in terms of debate, uh, in terms of engagement. They are called generals. There is the auditor general, uh -huh. there is accountant general, uh -huh. there is the auditor uh, there is the attorney general. Uh -huh. Those three generals. And they work they, in tandem? No, even mm. if they don't work in tandem. But their offices. They, their offices must be streamlined because money gets lost because not these ones are not cocoons. I am not actually blaming the necessarily, especially the Auditor General mm. and the and the Accountant Account General, mm. but the Attorney General's office is the one which approves these uh, mm. these monies of mm. compensation. Mm. 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 They end up compensating people who are the wrong people and monies go back to them. But I'm saying, what about focusing on the office of the accountant, uh, account general, accountant general? Accountant general. Yes. Many people don't know. Mm. Even mm. if you ask people who the name Mr. Mm. Semakura. If the people ask you whether mm. they, they know how they say Makura, they would say they don't know. Mm. That is an office that is supposed to control money before it is wasted. Mm. Let's use a... I'm not judging him because that's a court case or whatever, the, the case of Mr. Kazinda, mm. who, was, who is in prison. Mm. Uh, that he was able to spend billions of money. How does the, the treasury... And the Bank of Uganda, and you have the controller, the, the accountant general, some countries they call him controller general. Uh -huh. How does he release that money to anybody? You know, there should be systems of management that you spend that money and you know even who has received it and who has spent it. Uh -huh. So that office must be strengthened if it is not very strong, the accountant general. And let people debate that office. Let it be given more funds control money before it is spent. Mm. But also the attorney general's office. 
it has to strengthen itself, especially when it comes to compensations. You find land compensations, land fund, land whatever, and the, and the procurement, but also there is the office of procurement. Most money, most corruption actually goes into Process. uh, those Process. processes of procurement, much more than this one who gets some command and embezzled it. It is not where the and contracts, signing of contracts. Signing of contracts should also be looked into. That is where the office of attorney general comes in. But the president has, uh, you know, come out to strongly argue in favor of sidestepping those some of those strict legal processes and no, procedures, especially respecting uh, procurement, uh, evaluations to determine compensations and whatnot. So why are you crying? That's, that's <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> it, it, I think it reveals uh, some of the dilemmas that we have got to contend with. But I want no, no, to ask no, no, you... No, no, but mm. why, why a dilemma? Let, let things be streamlined. Mm. Let the accountant general come up with very uh, streamlined accounting systems of fast spending the money. This uh, uh, treating the symptoms by the auditor general. It is already too late. Mm. It should be now done by the accountant general. So that office should be strengthened, nice. both legally mm. and maybe by manpower or human resource, mm. and they focusing on it and debating it so that it controls expenditure. Mm. Yeah, wastage in expenditure, the, the, the office of the accountant general. Yes, Priska, yes, there is a major concern, um, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics in its uh, report of 2023-2024, mm. indicated that uh, just nearly one million of Ugandans pay tax, actually. Only? Mm -mm. Only, nearly. So, uh, you are saying those registered. who directly pay to revenue authority. Otherwise, all of us. Yes, yes, in yes. Indirectly, direct, of course, yes. certainly. Yes, not in the, in yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I am saying directly. directly yes, yes, those that pay tax to the Uganda Revenue Authority. But how is that possible? Given a population of given a population of forty five million, <laughs> definitely because if how do we show up the numbers? Officially ah, paying tax. Tax. The, 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 the people. The people. It's about uh, four million, three, three to five million Ugandans. Out of forty six million. Mm. Yes, who are paying currently. That is why there's so much effort in expanding that register to ensure that more people come on board. Because meaning that the tax burden is lying with only these five million Ugandans. Who are paying taxes as opposed to and there are very many who are above 18 because from 18 onwards it's supposed to be you can be a legal person and begin paying tax so that is still a very big question it goes back to what professor said the economy is very informal and that is something we are trying so hard to ensure that everyone is on board to pay that fair share of tax otherwise the same people are going to be but the same people here yeah, they are burdened professor also of concern is that a majority of the minority the critical minority that pays taxes is comprised of foreigners, foreign businesses, uh, foreign well, corporate really, there are very many entities. By, by what percentage? Um, 20%. 20% of those is foreigners. Of the, 80% of that register uh, is local. Is local. Yes. So but I mean, the, the substantial sum. The substantial the sum is collected from, course, from the foreigners and, yes, and their companies. companies yes. So, Professor, is it that? also indicative of some of the challenges in the economy. How can we go about that? Actually, now... Doesn't it in peril? Now, that is a very good question. Mm. <laughs> that is an indicator that although the foreigners are few, mm -hmm. they are the ones who pay the most. Yes. yes meaning. But uh, that one also meaning translates into meaning... Mm. No, 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 no. Leave alone. That Uganda's economy has been foreignized. Mm -hmm. That's another angle. Mm. That the, Uganda's economy is foreignized. In the sense that the, the commanding heights, mm. what we use called commanding heights in Marxist economics, the bigger uh, economy, the, 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 the sectors of the economy that affect others are in foreign hands. Mm. I will give you examples. There is almost no Af uh, indigenous bank in Uganda now. In you that name, there is none. Certainly. None. Even the uh, Centenary, Centenary uh, Bank, mm. the shares, the right, majority right. shares are foreign. So the rest, and you know, it is banks which mobilize a lot of foreign mm -hmm. money and foreign profits and, and profits, proceeds. You got telecommunication companies. Mm -hmm. 
the same mm. thing mm. and mm. airtel mm. they are foreign mm. go to oil companies mm. all these oil companies the tatars and whatever Sinok. they are they are foreign, foreign. Mm. uh you can go and name it and name it so that means they are paying the highest tax but then they they are also foreign companies that means not uh, and and uganda has got what is called in economics a liberalized capital account a liberalized capital account means that you don't control how much money is taken out of the country you mm. just liberalize it mm. so now these foreign people mobilize resources our resources internally here they get the proceeds and repatriate them outside that is the challenge have you seen most of those companies which are the richest which are foreign companies investing here they don't even build mm. if you will look at stambik parent mm. even the buildings it bought from uh, former uganda commercial yes, bank they sold them they don't have buildings they don't invest you see banks are supposed to invest mm. but if you have a foreign bank it will invest outside Externally. if you have an insurance company it is supposed to invest here but if they are foreign companies mm. they will invest outside but why is that professor what's the motivation because we have got a liberalized capital account you know we have so much gone capitalist liberalized we are so market more than the homelands of capitalism the british system if you you you, you want to know, they have not commoditized their they 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 are public services the, the, the national is it health services mm. is is government national but here we have become excited mm. and commoditized when we were rising we used to 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 castigate kenya that it was capitalist that it is a land of man it is a man and things like that as we talk when they were rising kenya retained certain assets as public assets more than uganda i mean they, 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 we, we sold our uganda commercial bank but they have got Kenya Commercial Bank which has even come mm. here that's a, a, a government company you have got a, a, i think a, 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 a Kenya diaries or something like that meat processing company meat mm. grain Brooks, mm. Kenya grain i think books it is private but they, they still have those public companies yeah which mobilize resources on behalf of For the government. people but for us we liberalize it so in some countries they have even started forcing i don't know whether uganda has also started forcing those foreign companies to float shares so that when you have mtn at least 40% are indigenous you don't just leave people come and invest mm. without floating mm. shares to the indigenous people because the problem is that is that they repatriate what they mobilize mm. out of the country mm. they don't invest it here and we have got a, a bad history where we chased away indians mm. Mm. in 1972 mm. so these indians and chinese who have come they have that back in their mind anytime, they say anytime. let's invest here but any time we can be chased away mm. and we leave our Thank assets you. here our capital assets here mm. so they for them they are just mobilizing funds mm. they are just mobilizing funds they get the profits repatriate them because we have got a liberalized capital account when you go to countries like ethiopia they don't allow you to repatriate their funds like that you, you a certain amount must remain in the country i think tanzania has started with is it mining companies and other corporations saying you must float shares at a certain percentage when you are a foreign company to the indigenous people because otherwise this is uh, uh, foreignizing the the, 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 economy. the economy and you have brought that question very clearly mm. and uh, i think we need to discuss it next time even exclusively mm. to look at the foreignization of uganda's economy mm. who owns uganda's economy is a fundamental question that uganda should uganda ask themselves answer, yes. this is not to say mm. that we should not allow foreigners come here no but we should put in place mechanisms yes, yes. to ensure that at least some of these proceeds are not simply expatriated we say that we are giving employment to ugandans but you know most of these companies also don't pay good salaries to you to 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 to, 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 to africans as foreign, as most of these foreign. foreigners who come bring in their expatriates mm. 
who earn who millions. Yes. But Ugandans, mm. that's, why, that's, why, that's why we are taxing. <laughs> and you work from 8 to 5 every day. But that is that, is that, be isn't that a fundamental failure of the government to it's not, a failure. not to regulate it is, it is a and put policy. in place yes policies to, to no that means we also go to the regulation you see when you, you you are running a market economy you should regulate it effectively and efficiently so the regulatory framework the regulatory regime in Uganda needs to be rethought mm. in fact I have seen the government going to uh, reform and uh, and and uh, uh, and what uh, uh, these uh, uh, parasitos it is called what rationalize. Mm. I'm not saying they shouldn't rationalize. And merge. But I thought the fundamental thing should have been to look at the, the foreign companies vis-a-vis -vis Uganda in relation to making sure that we don't have. And in the ten point program, there was that issue that we don't really uh, uh, allow hemorrhage of the economy and have increased economy. It is there in the 10 point program where you had that she's, an admin, she's involved in political mobilization. Mm. I hope she, she's going to look at the 10 point program. You see the 10 point program should be the blueprint of NRM. In point number five, integrated self-sustaining national economy. Mm. I was excited about that, the, the, point. The, 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 that issue, that, the, the, that point. The program? That program, mm. uh, that, pro that point, point number that five, point. Mm. not necessarily because it was new, because even it was not from where as such, I can tell you even where I saw it first, I was a student at the University of Dar es Salaam at that time when NRM came into power. And we were studying that one in political economy. It was first mooted by Justinian Weyamamu. The, mm. the, 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 he was a special economic advisor to President Nyerere. He wrote it in a book. Pervasive industrialization in Tanzania, published by Tanzania Publishing House in 1971, 75. Mm. He was the one talking about an integrated self-sustaining national economy. Mm. So how do we have it unless we address the question of the hemorrhage of our economy? Thank you, Professor, for that opinion. Focus on Parliament now takes a short break. When we return, we evaluate the report on the National Budget Framework paper for the year 2024-2025. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten, and a right for protection of minors, among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back. This is the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV. In this segment, we evaluate the National Budget Framework paper for the year 2024-2025. I'm going to begin with you, Priska. We've seen this report come out highlighting uh, the physical situation and position of Uganda as a state, but also pointing out some of the priority areas that the budget will focus on. What's your uh, overall view of the budget framework paper? Um, thank you very much. I think, I think when Parliament sits, of course there are very many factors that come into play when they are allocating the different monies in the budget. And um, time and again, I've seen Uganda say, why can't, there I feel that there's a mismatch between what parliament is allocating and prioritizing with what the other people in the country think. So I think um, parliament should be more people-centric 
and, and focus towards what are the biggest areas where majority of the Ugandans watch the beneficial, let's say healthcare, uh, education, what are those spheres that we see most of the Ugandans will actually partake of? Of course, infrastructure has really be, has been there temporary again as a priority area, but of course, countrywide, the infrastructure has been done very, very excellently. Countrywide, if you travel across the country to the north, to the west, the roads are really good, but we need a better uh, infrastructure push, especially here in the central, the central area, given that it's, it's where most of the business is happening, all the, most of the GDP actually of the country comes from this area. So there is a mix really, there's, there's a, for me as a, from my perspective, there is a mix between what was prioritized and what would be the ideal in the prioritization. Why, why is there discord uh, between the population and parliament? Because effectively, parliament is the collective representation of, of the, the wishes of the population. So how is it politics, difficult for parliament to prioritize the actual needs of the population? As, I've, as I said earlier, there are very many factors, but I know politics comes into play, then of course the numbers, but everything really, it goes back to parliament. Parliament is, can best answer this question because they are the, they are the key persons that, that do this appropriation. That is clearly their work and their mandate. So it goes back to them and they would best answer would have been good for us to have a parliamentarian in this sitting and they would best answer that one. Yeah. Professor, has parliament failed in its fundamental duty to effectively appropriate for the national resources? Two, Prisca here seems to contend that uh, there is a discord, some sort of mismatch in expectations between what parliament is prioritizing vis-a-vis -vis what the population expects to be prioritized. Is there an invisible hand that is forcing uh, this result? Three, we see in the budget there are areas that have been prioritized like security, uh, but we are not at war. But you realize that security takes a substantial amount of the monies. Then areas, critical areas that you know affect the day-to-day -day, uh, living of, 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 and sustenance of the population, like health, education, are not sufficiently funded. What's the problem? Thank you. But first of all, let me first co correct the impression most of you are giving. <laughs> uh, Parliament is not the originator of resource allocation. Mm -hmm. It just uh, scrutinizes resource allocation. The budgetary allocations are done by the executive. Cabinet. Yes, but Parliament can veto and decide yes, to prioritize can, yes. some areas. There, there can be debate. For they have that, limitations. That, that's the issue. They have limitations. Uh, Parliament has limitations because once somebody has given, like if I wanted to bias you and we are in a seminar, me who has presented the paper, I will, I will bias the debate. They will, you will debate my ideas actually. So once government has allocated, it is not very easy uh, for the, the parliament to begin removing money from here to there, and they are not prepared even. You see, government officials take a whole year time, mm. time and scrutinize, and they know where to allocate. And the policy, uh, policies are made by government, mm -hmm. not by parliament. Yes. Parliament just makes laws. Mm. But even parliament doesn't make laws, by the way. They, As you were they are originated in, largely by the executive. You were told in, in, in your fact. primary civics. Mm. <laughs> you know? Because all, almost all bills, 90% come mm. from government. Mm. Then parliament approves. Mm. Now in the process of approval, you are already biased how to debate. From where to start. Where, from where to start. So mm. it comes from government. Parliament can approve or disapprove, but it's not very easy. After all, when you reach a certain point, they will call you to uh, 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 an NRM caucus, and then they will, uh, they, they, they will those, sort those, you out. Those, you will be brought to order. Considered, but Professor, are you suggesting that parliament is captive, or it's now a redundant body that we... Well, it is you know, doing made. some things, especially in terms of uh, uh, accountability, scrutinizing. If government didn't know that there was somebody to scrutinize, they would also not be as uh, sensitive as they are. But by and large, we are saying 
by and large parliament uh, 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 resource allocation is done by the executive now based on what that is where we need the principles of government what is it that informs them what values what principles inform them oh. if i were a, a government because i'm from the progressive wing or the left of the center i would first look at ubos ubos says the following regions are poorer than others. Others are actually in middle income. Others are not even facing anywhere. Because poverty levels in some areas are above 60%. In others, they are less than 10%. You get me? Mm -hmm. So I would allocate resources in order to overcome that uneven development in the country. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at recent results of UNEP, P7, mm -hmm. there are certain regions which had students pass and others which failed. didn't failed miserably. Mm. Those which failed miserably, miserably are those which are also need, poor, need be, yes, which need needed some support. affirmative yes, action and support. Yes, yes. That should inform budgetary allocation. One. Two, budgetary allocation should also be informed by the strategic long-term plan of government. What does it want to achieve? If it were me, what would I say? I think we are living in a, in, in, in a, um, a knowledge economy, technology age. If we have to be competitive in the world, we have to be competitive. I would have allocated much resources in research and development in that area. And make sure you supervise it and there is innovation and creativity in this country. That would inform my allocation of resources. But what has informed allocation, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But as you said, defense, defense is necessary mm -hmm. unless there is security in the country, stability. Now, my problem with that allocation is that most of the, 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 junk, the chunk of that one goes to uh, uh, classified mm -hmm. expenditure. Now, that classified expenditure, first of all, it is not taxed by the when we are talking about tax. There is a lot. You know, government is the biggest spender. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so when the government spends indirectly, the revenue authority should comes, tax comes. comes in mm -hmm. as income tax. Mm -hmm. But now you can not tax uh, that money called classified. what? Classified. classified. <laughs> because how how do you tax classified? You can't tax it. Direct tax, no. And that is where the problem goes. Secondly, when they are allocating money, they should also look at boosting our companies. You give a lot of money to URA. Uh, no, no, not URA. You, UNRWA. Mm -hmm. huh? But that yes. money is taken by foreign companies. Why don't we promote local companies as long as they don't do should they work? Local companies at least do something so that that money remains within the country. Now, what informs parliament? They are promoting uh, the engineering arm of the UPDF and NEC to, uh, to, to undertake some of those works. That's, that's the policy now. I don't know whether UNRWA money goes to those engineering brigades mainly, uh, also, uh, but even that one has its own problems because how sustainable is it? Are you going to have the whole economy and the technical team uh, from the army? Because it seems we are militarizing civil service we are militarizing economic issues and it has its own problems. Have you followed what is going on in Pakistan? You yes, know where it came yes. from? Mm. Because most of the economy in Pakistan is within the army. Mm. And once you militarize the economy, the, the, the army will not leave. If you go to Sudan, you so find that the military is in the economy, mm. is, in, is in Egypt, is mm. in the economy, in Pakistan, in Miami, that one also has its own challenges, but that's a discussion for another time. But here, Professor, the justification, <laughs> for the justification is, hey, let, me just, <laughs> let, me, let me just conclude on this point. The justification in Uganda is that the army is more efficient and we almost to, incorruptible, we the unlike the civilian section of the population. I, I said let's have the discussion for another day because the other time when there was a problem in Somalia, the president clearly said the problem is corruption. That one, at least he said it. I don't want to say it here. And then you say, because we don't know 
even how the army uh, operates and the, the auditor general says the the, the neck is it neck yes mm. neck that is the national business, enterprise the business corporation wing. Uh, the business of, of wing the army. yeah mm. has not remitted any dividends to government none zero that is auditor general not never sir mm. you know so but that one we can discuss it another day the issue is <laughs> neck, uh, neck and pays i am taxes. not yeah the what neck pays taxes we are saying, as a government entity, okay. it is supposed to remit is it returning profit? dividends mm. to government. Ah, mm. okay. Dividends to government. Mm. We are not okay. talking about no tax. tax now. <laughs> we are talking about dividends. Okay. Yes? Uh, like other companies of government which have not done so. Mm. They are, they are they few. Are they are few which are, have. So uh, let's discuss that one another time. So we are saying that Parliament and the executive which actually brings that bill because I think that is a bid. The budget is a bid. Yes. It comes from government. Mm. It is already biased. So if you were to look at uh, the parliamentary input into, the, into that uh, framework, yeah, it is not maybe even 30% in terms of reallocation of resources. But even parliament reallocating resources, what is it? What value informs the parliament? The other day, you find the office of the speaker has got this much. The deputy mm -hmm. speaker has got this much. For, uh, uh, past speakers were given vehicles of 600 million. So, unless also in parliament is informed by progressive ideas, mm -hmm. progressive values, progressive principles working for the people, even parliament is not far from the executive. We are talking about the, well, regi the, the government the regime, way, the political the regime. Cabinet, the, uh, the political cabinet. regime when it comes to para, uh, allocation of resources, what is it that informs, informs them? Yes. Is it disparity in the country? Is it Politics. technological development? Mm -hmm. Is it what? Because ultimately you end up having that bloated parliament. Mm. The parliament of Uganda is almost the size of India. India is 1.4 billion people. Almost the same as Uganda. UK is about 60 billion. I mean, 60 million people. And it is, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 times richer than Uganda. Eh? 200 times, I think. Mm. But they have almost the same number of parliament. Mm. But we are increasing constituencies. We are increasing municipalities. We are increasing uh, districts. And that is expenditure. That ends ex so you find at the end of the day the expenditure goes to administration. What I would do if I was government, I would put a ceiling in terms of percentage yeah. that we have the national budget of 52 mm -hmm. trillion. Mm -hmm. I would say 20 percent only should go to administrative, administrative costs, administrative. overhead costs. Put the rest mm -hmm. put a cap. Mm -hmm. The rest should go to pre Health program yeah. investment. investment. I think that would guide the government. Mm -hmm. In, the, in, in that allocation. But if you leave it open-ended, mm. and we have got uh, this uh, budgetary discipline also, you budget, before you know it, there is a supplementary budget. Mm. Before even the first quarter release it's has ended, mm. you are already True. asking for supplementary budget. And most supplementary budget is not in development budget. It is in consumption budget. Mm. So we should limit consumption budget administrative budget for to a certain percentage, even when it goes to supplementary budget. So that when we have supplementary budget, it should also go to development budget. I think that would discipline them so that you know that ultimate budget, if it is 52 billion or even more, because you budget 52 billion, but you end, you end up spending more than 52 billion. Two By the most uh, trillion. Mm. Most of it even goes to this uh, uh, Mabanja. Hey, you know, mm. debt. Debt refinancing. Now we have added on Congo. We are paying Congo. Mm. We are paying Congo mm. a debt. Last year we paid, is it 2 trillion? 1.8 in the region of, I think, 1 trillion. To Congo. They about, yes. Mm. And who rooted the, 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 the minerals of Congo? Well, was it Uganda which benefited or individuals? Individuals. As a country. So anyway, but that is the past. We have to pay them. But I hope we shall not add on. Now that we, we are even <laughs> there, let's not <laughs> let's hope that we shall not go there. The, the, the issue is uh, insatiable. <laughs> my my take would be that let there be principles, but then principles are not just also manufactured. 
it depends upon the people who the are in the government mm. the people in the government the regime the the the, 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 the thinking regime mm. the value systems of those in the government is it investment for production and investment social service delivery in a socially just society or it is investment for other criteria that is what i would say in my opinion so my assessment is that the parliament and the executive which deal with the budget we are not informed by social justice principles to redistribute the resources in the country so that we don't have two countries in one because if you have two countries in one you will not have peace there are those who say having peace is monopolizing instruments of coercion mm. no mm. that is treating the symptoms the underlying issue is social justice once you have social justice you will reduce or eliminate tension. dissent mm. and tension and therefore you will spend less on security the more you create two countries in one the more you have Disparate. disparities the more you have tension, tension and the more you spend on defense and security Mm. So we have to reverse that trend by promoting equitable distribution of opportunities and money. Because equal distribution money is not is about money. only money, mm. it is about also other opportunities. Mm. Mm. That's rather strong advice. I hope the powers be <laughs> listen, they hear. I hope they listen. Uh, Priska, one of the priorities in the uh, budget framework paper is to boost uh, the broad participation of the population in the money economy. Mm. Inclusion, so, they say. Inclusion, mm. okay. So the government has designed uh, a raft of programs. Mm. Previously, in Tandikwa, Emioga, we now have the popular parish mm. development model. Mm. And the government has earmarked substantial amount of funds mm. uh, to that. Mm. Can you qualify that? Yeah, the money has actually Can you qualify that? One billion mm. is put in PDM. Huh? Mm -hmm. Am I right? One, one trillion. One Sorry. trillion, yes, it's a one trillion. One trillion. Mm -hmm. Out of 52 trillion. Mm. If my English doesn't fail me, is mm. that substantial? In relative terms, given to given, what? Given, 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 given the other priorities, mm. the major priorities of the budget in relative comparative terms, it would be substantial, Professor. I one it's out not, of 52 a, not, out of 52 of course, because it's not a but <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm saying comparatively okay. given to, to 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 the other you know budgets okay. uh, it could be quite a significant I will sum. adjust my english <laughs> mm -hmm. but but yes uh the question is in your evaluation because the other programs have been you know spectacular mm -hmm. failures mm -hmm. they have failed to alleviate the real issue yeah. will this succeed this time round? I think everything goes back to management. You see, as sometimes I've heard people say, ah, Museven Murunji, Neavantube. Have you had such statements in, in, this, in society that uh, let's say the headmaster of this school is very good, but the teachers are not delivering? So it goes back to who is managing this program and how is it being managed? I remember from the word go, there was deliberative for ensuring there's mindset change. There's even a budget for that, for this mindset change. And then people are, are, are first organized mentally before the money is given out. But in a short time, the money began being distributed. So I think if there is no administrative, and the money shouldn't go too much in administration again, the down salary for this one, that the committee, this one has to get this, this money is for this, no. The money has to target those groups that have been formed to, to benefit from that money. But if there is no deliberate, I don't know, I can say, we need to, to toughen in handling that that whole project, if the person who's coordinating it and having that oversight, let's say Minister Majesi, Honorable Majesi, or whoever in local government is in, is, is in charge of that project, if they are not very vigorous, it will still not yield as expected. But so far, I have had some success stories even in our village. Some people will receive, I know people will receive of that money. And uh, yeah, it depends on the person. Of course, some people receive this money from government and say, ah, it is now my time to eat it. I voted for government. It is a payback. Others will say, ah, let me put something good with this money. But the whole, the overall people who are looking at that project should be the ones to be really, really hard 
on all the beneficiaries and all the people in the chain to ensure that that money actually is put to use as 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 expected. Professor, you dispute the substantiality of the amount, uh, but I want us to understand the context and why I <laughs> emphasize that it's substantial. Because, this is because if you commit one trillion Ugandan shilling and you you know dish it uh, at a program access. that is amorphous, doesn't have solid you know legal backing, and when you appreciate that previously such attempts have failed. So I use it in a cynical sense as well. I hope you understand the context. So the question is, how does one trillion Ugandan shilling uh, be applied to a, a program that is ostensibly supposed to alleviate uh, people's you know, living conditions? How, 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 how does it work? Because previously these attempts have failed. Like Will there be magic this time round? Let me first uh, mention this one. <laughs> that another criteria I would use when allocating resources, especially the national budget, would also be looking at the local versus the national. How much money is going to the local? The local governments, for example. Mm. Look at the budget for the local government. As devolved units of government? Yes, vis-a-vis -vis the national. Mm. I know some national projects mm. also benefit the local, mm. but, but directly, what percentage mm. directly goes to, local to local governments? governments. Mm. That should also guide mm. the national budget because the majority of the population are in local and areas. Local, yes. So that one would be a criteria. But now coming back to that project which is supposed to uh, to, 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 to help to the, 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 the poorest of the poor. In principle, I agree with it. In principle, mm -hmm. that there should be money mm -hmm. to, uh, to go to help the poor. But the it was not thought out mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. First of all, it was an omnibus. Every parish. Mm -hmm. But there are some parishes with more people mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. others. They are not the same mm. number. That is number one. Number two, I think, in my opinion, spreading money thinly on the ground will not have impact. The money has been spread thinly, giving somebody one million. Yeah. Mm. One million. <laughs> you know what, what, it, what the, it stands for? The idea for? is that everyone gets... Mm. <laughs> Uh, but then we are not looking at Briwangwa Akwateko. We are looking at transformation. Of course. We are not looking <laughs> at affirmative <laughs> action. We are mm. looking at transformative action. Now, if it is transformative action, now one million, uh, 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 an average goat even up country is now 200,000. 200, mm. If you want to own goats, you will buy five goats. Mm. Five. One, two, three, four, five. You so don't have a house for them. You don't have uh, a porter to then look after them. Two. You buy two goats. <laughs> you don't have uh, medicine because these days there is a lot of uh, uh, worms you know, and whatever yeah. which kill them. Mm. So five, uh, one million is five goats. Now, I don't know whether five goats will transform the society like that. I used the example of five goats. In my opinion, what would have been done by that period? This is subject to debate. Mm -hmm. I would, and each parish is 100 million. And it is over a period of time. Me, I would have invested that money in public assets. Public assets depending uh, based on the needs of that community. Public assets or uh, what some people call common good resources. Common good resources. If it is an urban center, you can have that 100 million invested in say, welding machines for a certain parish and or a, a certain a, a sector and in five years you'll have covered at least five uh, or more than five but that is per parish. If it is in a rural setting, some rural settings are different from others. Mm -hmm. There are those which lack water. 100 million can construct dams. Oh. More than one dam. If it is a question of access to productive water and you put it there. Some places don't have access. She talked about 
upcountry roads being the, be, uh, the, the, the best. Let me uh, qualify that one. It is East Tamaka Road is going to towns. Mm. There are rural areas okay, which fine. are inac inaccessible course, course, completely. And that is where the produce comes from. Mm. I would invest in those Very produce, good. in those roads, bring produce. That's a public investment. You can even have a, a, a milling machine in a certain area where they grow a lot of sim sim. Mm. You put there a milling machine, maybe under cooperative or under certain, but it is a public asset investment. Mm. There you will not spread resources thinly on the ground. In the past, by the way, when we were young, there used to be tractors uh, at, uh, at, uh, at Gomboronas. Mm. Or for, they would merge like say, Siri Gomboronas and give them tractors. Mm. You know? So people access those tractors at a subsidized cost. Just the cost may be for fuel. fuel. And the rest would may, be met by government. So, to me, that trillion should actually go to the rural areas because rural areas need transformation. But that money should be invested in common resource development. But giving it to individuals, I, 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 I normally, when I go home, I understand my home area. I was in my LOC one. People who were given that money, you find somebody has no land. You give somebody one million who has no land because he's the poorest of the poor. What do you do with that one million when you have no land at all? You are an off, uh, you are a, 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 a widow. They are given one million. What you do? You probably start a drinking joint, mm -hmm. and before you know it, everybody has taken your drink, has not paid you. I don't think those people will pay it back. But if it was invested in a common resource pool like roads, or you can think of a, a store where people can store their produce or a bridge, to me, that would make more uh, transformation than giving it to individuals. Finally, let me comment on uh, mindset change. Mm -hmm. Who is going to change the mindset of who? Mm -hmm. We, 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 the corrupt mm -hmm. people in Kampara. This corruption in Kampara, you are going to change the minds of people up country. That you are going to change the mindset of people. Wh what are you going to change when you are corrupt here in Kampara? Are you going to change corruption up country? Or you are going to take it more there. So mindset change for to me, me is not the question. Isaac, just, just to speak. There should be community centers mm. where there would be participation. Mm. Participation even by NGOs, participation by the church, participation by local government, participation by central government to see how, yes, progressive farmers to change the minds. But somebody coming from Kampara with this little soap, uh, shoes of yours, with glasses and you are threatening people with glasses that I'm coming to change your mind. With your glasses like these ones you have, oh. go and change the mind On of the On that design. point, Professor, isn't mindset change supposed to be a oh, function of societal response mm. to the stimulus created by the government in respect of My everything? My mother was itself. using a tractor in 1969. She's a peasant. She, she was a peasant the late. Right? She didn't know how to do it and write. And my father, who is still alive, 105 years old, he grew coffee without anybody going there to tell him to change the mind. He was growing coffee. He was growing fruits. He was owning cows. And nobody went there to change his mind. But the market that was provided for coffee in those days when they had cooperatives mm. was an incentive for people to grow coffee. Mm. So mindset change, I'm not disputing it completely. It is necessary, but it must be accompanied by public assets. You go to Kawanda. Do you know where Kawanda is? Most people know Kawanda Research mm. Center, mm. The, where the, the, the highest research is done. Yeah? Of agriculture. Mm. And some of the people who work there as group employees come from the surrounding areas of Kawanda. Isn't it? You go outside Kawanda and you see whether they have followed what is taking place in Kawanda. They are the very people who are planting those plants in Kawanda Research Station, but outside the station, there is poverty at its, uh, at its peak. Why haven't they adopted that technology? Have we asked ourselves questions? Haven't they changed their minds? But maybe they don't have resources, but maybe there is another reason, but we need to have thoughts out.
this one. I think uh, either just to, professor has, professor has a right to his opinion on what he of what course. he thinks the money should have <laughs> been directed. It might but be But I wrong. think from a political perspective, it is very good that you that you make because everyone has been crying to a capital. As Muse is canvassing for votes, maybe or any other person, they are telling them these are the issues. ABC. So I'm very sure that makers of this uh, project sat down and looked at what was happening during the campaign time, or maybe through, through looking for votes, what did people actually want? Campaign time is not the right time. should be under as a study. But, but, yes, but, but study. that presupposes... But I think giving the person that, that one that, million, that presupposes, I think it's good for a young person. For me, it, as a youth leader, I think it is very okay. It presupposes... Because a, I may have it, my degree, for example, but I'm in the village, I have my father's house. If I get that one million, I can begin from somewhere. Even, even if I get my two goats or my you are here in chicken, Kampala, you are not in the village. Or my ten chicken. Uh, if, uh, as, as, assuming I was in the village and I had that one million to develop to me, I would have utilized it with my degree or my diploma, whatever paper I have. And if it's a P7 paper or S4, at least I can do something with that money than me waiting for a community project to benefit me. The problem with, uh, you know, that examination and the resultant solution is that it presupposes a political response mm. to a As problem to. that is not nat naturally mm. political. Mm. Because if you just dangle money, mm. a million, mm. to a youth in Karamoja mm -hmm. or Bukedi, and then the next day they drink it, so what? So they are going to wait for the next political season after five years and again demand and say, ah, now I, I wasn't able to transform my life economically, therefore, Give me much give more. Me more. Is it sustainable? Definitely. Now, that's the problem, that I is think. Right. Professor is trying to... But a public asset, mm. common, common user and if, source. If we sit in a town hall and we agree in Morton District local government and we agree and say, we the youth of this sub-county and this parish, we have agreed, so be it. Because I think in principle, mm. just like Professor said, it's a very good approach. Mm. But the, implement, the, people, the implementation... The principle is good. <laughs> the implementation <laughs> seems to focus on achieving political expeditions as opposed to, as opposed to helping the person <laughs> radical transform. economic transformation. Okay. So, but, but let me ask the question, uh, Priska, what's there for the, the youth in the national budget framework in practical terms, apart from the broad universal parish mm -hmm. development model, mm -hmm. what is there to target? I think IT as well. Of course, that is for only the youth who are going to have let's access to IT, IT tools, technology. Uh, there's been uh, an effort, I would say. Not much, but some effort has been put in that regard. So I think technology-wise, that is a very good advantage for us as the young people. Why? Because young people are more tech-savvy as opposed to, let's say, the elders. So You are right. If they could delve in that one Teaching very... Teaching me new technology now. Yes, because now <laughs> me and Professor have put right now and let's sprint. Oh, we have an interview and it's... Perhaps I might beat Professor Herbert, I will beat him on some things, but on that one, maybe I'll be the one to on beat Zoom, him. You'd win. That on Zoom, you would win. That's what I would definitely beat him. So, technology is something we would really harness as young people. If we leverage our, our, our powers around, and look at how TikTok has grown. There are many things, there are apps, there are many developments which have come in from the young people, and if we use technology rightly, I think it can give us an edge. Professor? Uh, before I that, okay. I will agree with her on that one. And that's what I said, initial mm. research and development, mm. I would have innovation hubs, mm. create more innovation hubs. Mm. Government has started, that's I think right. there yes, is one there, in the market yes, right now, mm. but we need more of those even at the district mm. level. But donor funded. Eh? It in doesn't matter. Mm. If we utilize it very well, the, yes. what's wrong with donor funding? Yeah. If we utilize it very well, mm. it doesn't matter. Let's not be right, against donor yeah. money yeah. as such, mm. because government gets it and other and countries have together, yeah. If we can have innovation hubs, mm. but you can go on with your question. Uh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to respond to the innovation oh, hubs. Yes. Mm. Maybe just to add on, Professor, isn't that supposed to be also a component of the broader education aspect? Even education, Because if you course. speak of innovation and technology, doesn't it, it also impact directly? No, that, the nature uh, of education? Uh, that, that is broadening it. Mm. We can have a discussion mm. for another time in terms of education alone. Mm. But uh, we should have to invest more in uh, IT and IT-related technologies, but follow up by creating innovation hubs mm. where students, ca where the youth can go mm. and exercise mm. their uh, 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 skills mm. and knowledge. And that is uh, the, the, the way to go. That is setting up innovation hubs. Now, an innovation hub in a town 
of a certain district will be utilized by many people than giving this youth mm, just one, one million. But the innovation hub can assist Everyone many people and cause transformation. This business of uh, spreading money thinly is uh, affirmative action and affirmative action addresses symptoms. It does not address structural transformation of the underlying causes of the problem. I hope you get me there. Mm -hmm. That is why for me, I am for putting resources together and setting up common use resources mm -hmm. up country and manage them very well. Mm -hmm. They would have more transformative yes. effect on society mm -hmm. than spreading money thinly to individuals who don't even have capacity right. to absorb it. A person who has never earned 200,000 yeah. Well, we if you give that value. person one million, mm -hmm. it is too much to absorb. And at the end of the day, it will be wasted. But if you provided an innovation hub mm. for people, even upcountry people mm. now have yeah, some skills, true, can, some mm, internet and, skills, yes, by the way, that in innovation time. hub can cause more transformation in that society. Or if you start a, a, a foundry, a foundry for people uh, to use commonly mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. an urban setting, mm -hmm. I think that would have more transformation. That was my whatever. But then, then I don't know what informs the budget. The budget can also be informed, of course, by political strategies. How do you spread money so that during campaigns you say, I brought you money. Didn't you receive the money? Don't you remember I gave you money and you received the million? But at the end of the day, it becomes like Bonaba Gaga, not Bona. What, what was Bonawat? Bagagaware, I see. Mm. Bonawagagaware, Entandikwa, I don't know what. They all fizzled out without having transformation of society unless you put their assets, mm. common user assets by the public, of the public, and people use them. To me, they would have more transformation. That is my view. And if I was in the government, that is what I would look into, would that, look yeah, into rather than spreading money thinly and throwing money at development. Destroying money at development will not develop a country. The more money you have does not mean the more development you, you experience. If that was a, the case, countries like Kuwait would be the developed countries of the world. These Arab countries have got a lot of money, mm. but they are not developed. Mm. Why? Because they are not investing it into productive ventures like science and technology mm. and skills development. Thank you, Professor. Proceeding your closing remarks, I want you in a minute or two to examine the perennial issue of debt, respecting the fiscal discipline of the government. There are concerns from the public that uh, our debt is ballooning by the day. It's not serviceable. And, and, and the government <coughs> doesn't seem to have the attitude, not the commitment to arrest the problem. Rather, by the day, they keep on borrowing to the extent that they are now competing with the private sector to borrow from the local banks. Yeah. So, Professor, address that as you also register your closing remarks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's close by looking at because it's part of the budget and most of our funds, a big chunk of our, resource, our budget goes to service the debt. And yet we don't even go very far in servicing the debt and we are getting more debt. First of all, let's talk about the figures. Government talked about about 80 trillion. Yeah? The total. The total. Consolidated. 81 or something like mm, that. Mm. The Auditor General told us 97. That's a big difference. It's a discrepancy. A big discrepancy in trillion shillings, mm. not mm. in billions. Mm. That's a big discrepancy because I think the Auditor General looked at a bigger picture. When you are talking about debt, you don't only look at this money which you borrow from external funders and, the, the, and the bonds. You also look at the debts you have with the people. I mean, the Human Rights Commission awards people money, you have not paid it. The, the school has borrowed the money to pay for partial suppliers. You, are, you, suppliers. Mm. you have not talked about it. The other day, I saw the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Health, talking about is it 14 trillion or billion or whatever that they owe, I think, water. Mm. That one is not counted. When you count that, even. It can go Beyond beyond 100 trillion. trillion. 100 trillion is called what? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it has got another name. So there is a challenge of, of the debt servicing. And therefore, when we are borrowing, all countries borrow. Mm. 
but they borrow and put in productive ventures so that it you produce mm. and you can get it back. But it seems we are borrowing at times for consumption. You don't borrow for consumption. Look at us parents. You just <laughs> borrow money, pay fees, for pay, pay for malaria mm. treatment. Mm. At the end of the day, you sell your cow. Mm. You sell your land. Mm. Because you have not put it in. Mm. Imagine borrowing for consumption is the worst form of borrowing. Mm. Should be borrowing for Development. Thank you, Professor Priska. Register your contribution on that question of debt. Yes, I think, um, of course, remarks. as a taxman, definitely, uh, as we are trying to ensure that we're supporting the country in all the expenditure, supporting government primarily, uh, we would look forward to ensuring that this money that we collect is sufficient for the country. But now, if the, if the debt question keeps coming and debt keeps on growing and growing, it becomes also cumbersome. So everyone is going to be stretched. And at the end of the day, every Ugandan, I saw some time in the papers, they were saying all of us are going to pay 1.1 1, 1. 1 million, 1.5 million, I think. They were saying mm -hmm. us and our unborn children would be paying that And debt. that one was calculated based on 81, not that 97 was, uh, of the was, Auditor General. Was, uh, like two years ago. <laughs> so everyone is going to be burdened if this, if this debt. So it goes back to our leaders, really. I want to speak to our leaders, to speak into our leaders' hearts so that when you're, when you're getting this, when you're doing this borrowing uh, as finance, as as parliament think of that think of the effect think of the long term effect at times even as, a, as, a, as an individual there's money you can say i'm going to borrow but there's money i can not borrow now and i will live within if i have if i want maybe a hundred thousand but i have 50 let me work within the 50k perhaps everything i need will fit within the fifty thousand. maybe what i want is just a desire it's a it's a it's a need not it's to a live, want not to live not beyond your need. means uh -huh. So we can as well be stringent as a country and say, as you go and uh -huh, yourself. now it's too much. Let us <coughs> let us hold ourselves together and say, mm -mm, it is only this that we have, but let us work within what we have and don't again because if you keep on borrowing and borrowing, that 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 desire force for, for much more without seeing where it's going to come from, without seeing where you're investing it and it's going to and it's, and it's going to rip to rip eventually becomes a problem. So parting shots are that as you are eh, the five year plan or on strategy is to ensure that the country's GDP grows from where it is now to 20 to 20 percent. That is a long-term plan. So we're hoping the next uh, GDP four, or GDP ratio. GDP tax GDP ratio. That has yes. been the Sorry. thrust of tax professor's yes. submission. So, professor, just, just to reassure you. I will be happy if you reach even 17. I, am, I collect me every day I collect money. Every day I call the tax I send now today. Every day I have a target of like one. Let's reach 17% of GDP ratio. In a month ratio. I have like four billion to collect. As an individual, now how many staff do we have? Three thousand. So if we push and push and push. In the next four five years, I can I am certain. As long as it is with just the strategies, and yes, spreads through. That, yes, tax GDP pressure the whole is definitely operation. going to grow. The target is to grow it to to around 18, 20 percent. That is that that is that is that the would aim. Be great. That is the long term plan that, that, that the authority has right now. And we'll go on our side. I am a believer. We'll go on our side, and I believe it is possible. When you put in the work and the prayers, it will work, and our country shall be liberated from economic dependence. I want to appreciate you, Professor Mangusa Ndevesa and Mrs. Priska Amongin for your able participation on this show and for your patriotic contributions mm -hmm. to the national discourse. Mm -hmm. To our audience, once again, we appreciate you for keeping us company from the start up to the conclusion of this program. This is the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV. Engage us on our various social media platforms. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And also, you can engage us on Facebook and on X. I want to appreciate our production team for keeping us on air. See you next time.